the session, uh, participants are just filtering through from the waiting room. We're going to get started properly in a minute, but welcome everyone. Lovely to see some of you have your cameras on. If you can, do keep it on throughout the session. It's, just, it's lovely to see uh, faces rather than a, a dark screen as we run the session. Right, let's get started. A warm welcome, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you joining us from the UK. Good morning, good evening for those of you joining this session from other parts of the world. It's a huge privilege to welcome you all to our 17th session in the Engaging with Evidence series. Uh, those of you who are regular participants on the Engaging with Evidence sessions uh, will probably know me. I'm Andrea Anastasio. I'm Head of Partnerships and Engagement at the Government Outcomes Lab. Uh, delighted to chair today's sessions on insights and lessons learned from the Mental Health Employment uh, mental health and employment partnership program, uh, which includes five different impact bond programs uh, commissioned, commissioned locally in England and supported through the Life Chances Fund. Again, I know many of you on this session will be familiar with the Life Chances Fund. For those of you who are not, it's a 70 million outcome fund launched by the UK government in 2016 to support social impact bond projects in England. Um, I'm sure one of my colleagues will share in the chat the link to more information about the Life Chances Fund. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you making uh, time from your busy days to join us this afternoon. For us, this is a really special session for a number of reasons. First of all, um, it's one of the sessions where we get to share our own work as the GoLab. So today we'll be discussing insights from the first evaluation report that we're doing on the uh, MHEP program. So there's more to come, but we're very excited and I'm really pleased to be joined by my wonderful researcher colleagues, El Carter and Emily Hulse. And alongside our researchers, again, huge, huge privilege to be joined by practitioners. Uh, Julia, Sarah, Oli, lovely to have you on the session. I'll give you a chance to introduce yourselves um, in just a few minutes. The other reason why this session feels really special, especially today, is as some of you might be aware, this week in the UK, it's Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, so it's a really, a really big privilege for us as the Go Lab team to be hosting this important conversation today. Um, you know, figures vary, but I think it's widely accepted that around one in four people in the UK um, experience mental health issues every year. So it's just wonderful to be able to be discussing the important work that MHEP has been doing in supporting individuals with uh, experiencing uh, mental health issues and learning disabilities and supporting them into stable and high quality uh, jobs. The third reason why I think this uh, session is really special and important is that one of the key things that we're going to be discussing today goes to the part of a question that I know many of you in the social impact bond universe have been asking for years and us as the GoLab have been asking this question for a year. What's the value added? What's different uh, when you're delivering social services through an impact bond as compared to more traditional ways of funding social services? And with the MHEP program, as my colleagues will explain in just a few minutes, uh, the the way the program is set up and the way the particular intervention that's being delivered um, through MHEP and in other traditional, I guess, commissioning models offers really interesting ways and opportunities for uh, that comparison between kind of impact bond versus something else. Um, so very excited to get to the heart of those questions in just a few moments, just a little bit uh, more in terms of like housekeeping, because I, before we get started properly, I'm seeing lots of familiar faces on the session. Uh, lovely to see you coming back to the to, to our Engaging with Evidence sessions. If you are new to the work of the Government Outcomes Lab, just a quick 
word on uh, who we are and why we've convened this amazing group of experts. Today, we're a center of expertise based at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. And uh, the key question that we're trying to answer in our research work is how can governments work as effectively as possible with partners in the social sector and the private sector? And what does a focus on outcomes mean for the way we structure and manage those partnerships? Um, so we're a research center, but we're actually, I like to believe much more than that. We're very passionate about making sure that the insights that we generate through our own work and indeed the insights that other researchers and practitioners in the field generate are accessible and actively used by policymakers and practitioners around the world. Um, and we make sure we do that in a lot of, uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we've launched the Engaging with Evidence series two and a half years ago. So it's really exciting. It's a 17 session. We had lots more planned um, for the, the coming months as well. But just like really simply put the Engaging with Evidence series, it's our way to create an open platform for policymakers, practitioners, researchers around the world to, to get together and engage really meaningfully with the, the most exciting, most recent evidence coming out of the field. And I think we recognize, I find it difficult in, in my own job to kind of stay on top of all the new reports, new evidence, new data that's being generated in the field. So this is an opportunity for those of you too busy to read a hundred page report, although I would encourage you to do that and definitely read our um, MHEB reports in full, you know, if, if you're too busy, your colleagues are too busy, this is an opportunity to get the highlights um, from our research work, but it's also an opportunity to hear directly from the practitioners involved in the delivery of the programs and of what's their lived experience. So we're going to go really deep on the session today. Uh, before we get started, it's one, one final thing perhaps that's worth mentioning, especially if you're uh, attending for the first time. We want this these sessions to be as interactive as possible. So it's not just about us as researchers just you know presenting for 90 minutes our work. We want the session today to feel uh, very interactive. So I would just like to encourage each one of you on the session to you know engage with our amazing speakers, share your thoughts, questions, reactions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat very closely. Uh, my colleague Shri is also going to be keeping an eye on the chat and actually encourage all the speakers if they can multitask to also try to answer your questions uh, directly on the chat. We're also going to stop at different points throughout the session to sort of see if there are any questions from the audience. And so before uh, we introduce our session contributors, it would be wonderful to know who we have on the session with us. Uh, so I would just like to ask each one of you, I see we've got about 40 participants, please let's all take a minute now to just say hello in the chat, introduce yourselves, your organization, and bonus points from me if you also want to mention why you're here. I know you're all really busy, so I assume you've got specific questions or things that you hope to see covered on today's session. So do say hello in the chats. Um, love, it would be lovely to know who we've got. Uh, joining us this afternoon. So I'll give everyone a minute to do that. Wonderful. And as you're writing your welcome in the chat, um, uh, just maybe another word from me in terms of what to expect from today's session. Uh, we've split our discussion into two parts. So in part one, we'll hear from um, Sarah from Social Finance. We'll give a high level overview of the, of the MHEP program. And then we'll go to Emily who uh, shared the highlights from the, the research work. Uh, we'll pause for questions and then in part two of the discussion, uh, we'll bring in Julia, Oli and my colleague Elle as well for a panel discussion on some of the key findings from the report. We're going to focus um, specifically on the findings around how, as I was saying at the start, how the, the impact bond model compares to traditional contracting. And it'd be great to also, we want to explore some of the kind of key considerations along the around the long-term sustainability of the program beyond the Life Chances Fund and the wider learning um, for the system. So with that said, I will hand over to Sarah Bailey from Social Finance. Sarah, if you could first introduce yourself um and then yeah talk us through the material you've prepared for us 
Great, thank you, Andrea. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Bailey. I am a manager here at Social Finance. Um, I was the performance manager of the MHEP program from 2021 until 2022 for about a year. Um, and I've now rejoined the program in the last three or four months as the social finance um, steward oversight kind of manager of the program overall. And my colleague, Madeline Goldie, has taken over the day-to-day -day, um, performance management of, of MHEP. Um, so today I'm just going to talk you through a little bit more background about the mental health and employment partnerships, how we got to um, where we have to give you a little bit more context before Emily talks through some of the, the research findings. Um, so if I could get the next slide, please. Um, so who are we? So Social Finance, the organisation I work for, is a non-for-profit dedicated to improving services for the most vulnerable. And um, we do this through pioneering and innovative financing um, and supporting delivery um, partners in different ways. Um, so we designed and developed the first social impact bond in Peterborough for prison leavers um, way back in about 2009, I think. Um, and we learned a lot about the impact that outcomes-based contracting can have on services. Um, and we support um, across multiple issue areas, including employment, health, social care, and, and children's services. So back in 2015, Social Finance set up, set up HEP, the Health and Employment Partnerships, was a, which is a specific social purpose company that we run, focusing on supporting people um, with health conditions in, with a specific focus on mental health um, thrive in their, in their life through lasting and fulfilling employment. Um, so if you could skip to the next slide, please. So why focus on this? Um, a key reason um, is sort of illustrated by the statistic that a really small fraction of people with mental illness are in work, but the large majority of them want to. Um, and that is sort of our driving force behind the health and employment partnerships around supporting people that want to work into work um, to achieve the, the well-being um, outcomes as well as employment outcomes for those individuals. Um, so on the next slide, so how have we gone about doing that? Um, through HEP and MHEP, we have um, focused in on a service called IPS or um, Individual Placement and Support, which is a really well evidenced service delivery model for um, delivering employment support to people with mental illness. Um, the key ethos of the IPS, IPS model is that anyone has the potential to do real and paid work and will support them to do that straight away. So key features being compared to a traditional model is that people are supported straight away into work, um, not, not a training first type model. Um, people are supported into paid and competitive work in an area that actually interests them um, rather than going into volunteering or training to begin with. Um, and the employment specialists that run the IPS service are, are well trained and focus on um, working alongside the health healthcare partners that support these people um, and supporting them in their in their search for work and whilst they're in, in work. So as I mentioned, it's really well evidenced. Um, there have been numerous large long-term randomized controlled trials that have proven that IPS can lead to better job outcomes for people receiving the service compared to traditional models and that those people have improved health outcomes. Um, when MHEP was beginning, a lot of that research was international and there was scattered service delivery, but not a lot of it. Um, and part of the goals around starting up the MHEP program was to see how we can expand the delivery of IPS in the UK. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is more focused on, on why we launched MHEP specifically. So HEP is the partner company, MHEP, um, MHEP then was started as a specific social, uh, special purpose vehicle to deliver um, social impact bonds for services that deliver IPS. Um, so MHEP is its own separate legal entity. It has its own board. Um, the staff at, at Social Finance, including myself and my colleagues, um, provide the, the support within it. Um, and HEP is, is an owner of it alongside our investor, um, Big Issue Invest. So when MHEP was first started back in 2015, the, the, the goals you can see there on the slide, the key focus firstly was around combining national and local funding to deliver services locally. 
Um, so a key focus was finding national outcomes based funding pots, supporting local um, service delivery to access those those pots of national funding. So, for example, the Life Chances Fund. Um, another focus of, of MHEP is building evidence on what works. This is sort of the key focus of why we were running social impact bonds in this area. Um, an, impact, uh, an outcomes based contract requires you to collect a lot of data about what is being achieved through a service, which has then led to MHEP having a really rich data set about how the services have been run, the outcomes that have been achieved, um, and the longer term sustainment of, of jobs that people have been able to achieve. So that detailed data set about both the financials and the outcomes has been a really important um, success factor for MHEP that we've been able to then have policy discussions informed by evidence and support the expanded commissioning of IPS services in the UK. Uh, so out of MHEP we have supported um, increasing the amount of IPS services to, to national coverage of, of IPS for people with mental illness um, and alongside those that national rollout um, Social Finance has been able to spin up a service called IPS Grow, which Julia is a representative of here today who knows a lot more about it than me, but it is a, a service that supports the IPS services around the UK and enables them to deliver the best quality, high fidelity IPS services for the people that they work with. So these are sort of the, the flow on effects that came from the early phases of, of the MHEP vehicle. Um, a more recent goal of MHEP is around testing IPS in new settings. So the original research and the original context for an IPS service is a person with mental illness, um, but we have through MHEP supported social impact bonds that deliver the service to new cohorts. Um, so the first of this was people with addictions, which the SIB that we have run for people with addictions is outside of the scope of this evaluation, um, but was sort of our first foray into new cohorts and we've also um, run a SIB for people with learning disabilities um, to receive IPS which is in scope for this evaluation and you'll hear a bit more later on from Emily about that cohort. So the key uh, the key focuses of MHEP is what can we test and learn in a outcomes-based contracting setting and then how can we scale that out beyond one small SIB site into, into something more more broad. So for the addictions cohort, um, we've been able to then, after our SIB, support a national evaluation of addiction services for people, uh, in IPS for people with addictions, which has then led to a national rollout of IPS for people with addictions, which IPS Grow are working really hard to support those services as well. Um, so overall, through all of the SIBs that have been run through the MHEP vehicle, we've supported nearly 2,000 people into work, um, and over 60% of those people have stayed in work for at least six weeks. So if you could go on to the final slide, please, which gives a little bit more detail about the MHEP SIBs that are in scope for this evaluation. Emily will we'll talk through a bit more in, in terms of the research findings, but of the SIBs that we have run through MHEP, um, there were seven when I was managing them, and the, there are five that are in scope for this service. Um, these five SIBs, there are four sites that are delivering to people with mental illness, and one site that's delivering to people with learning disabilities, which is the site in, in East London, um, delivered by Tower Projects. And of those five services, four of them are London-based, and one of them is in Shropshire. Um, so this slide gives a little bit more detail around the actual mechanism of, of the SIB um, that MHEP runs for these services. So at a high level, the mental health and employment partnerships um, raises some initial investment from the big issue invest fund, so in the form of a loan. Um, we then work with our local partners, um, the commissioners of the local services, which is the local councils and the CCGs. They, used, they were called CCGs at that time, but are, um, are now renamed. And we worked with the local providers to, to set up these services in, in the local area. So MHEP then provides funding through to the service provider to start delivering the service in the area. Um, and then the service provider gives back to MHEP the information on the outcomes that they're achieving. Once we have the data about the outcomes that have been achieved, 
um, we are then able to claim both national and local outcomes-based funding. So our, our national outcomes funding comes from the Life Chances Fund and our local outcomes funding from the local payer. So we then use those outcome payments to continue to fund the service, to run the MHIP vehicle itself, um, to provide interest payments to our investors and the final repayment of our of our initial loans. But the, the central outcomes funding is only used to run the service and isn't involved in our investor flows. Um, a key element of this model is that as we collect the outcomes information in relation to the SIB, we also are actively supporting and monitoring the, the um, success of the services. So this is our performance management function. So we are meeting regularly with the service providers um, and with the commissioners together to talk through the, the figures and financials that we have around outcomes. And then we work closely with providers um, where there might be reductions in performance um, and work together to, to solve issues, essentially. Um, we then report to our board and our board can give us advice on what services might need more support or less support. Um, and we are then feeding that, that information back to our providers. So that is a bit of an overview of MHEP, the vehicle and services that it runs. Um, if anybody has any questions, just let me know. Um, Sarah, that's uh, brilliant. Thank you so much for such a clear and comprehensive context setting for us. I'm gonna pause for just a moment to check whether there are any points of clarification from our uh, audience and you've you know already mentioned the active monitoring and performance management the collaboration and we'll certainly come back to those points I know both in Emily's presentation next and certainly in the panel discussion but any any point of clarification for Sarah at this point okay I'm not seeing any hands up nothing in the chat so I'll move us on uh, to my wonderful colleague Emily who's been doing a lot of hard work on this report, but um, with a whole team behind her. But um, Emily, over to you to share with us some of the key findings from the first interim evaluation report of the program. Thank you so much, Andrea. And you're absolutely right. It's a massive group effort. Um, and so I do definitely want to extend my acknowledgements to everyone here who has made this report possible. So that includes the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, uh, Social Finance UK, Professor Adam Whitworth, as well as colleagues within the GoLab and uh, colleagues that have unfortunately left the GoLab, such as Tanya, who's also present in this webinar today. So if we could get my slides up, I am willing and ready to jump straight in. Perfect, thank you so much, Sri. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Hulse. I'm a research associate at the lovely Government Outcomes Lab, and I'll be taking you through our latest evaluation report, which I think has relevancy for anyone working or interested in social impact bonds, uh, social outcome contracts and employment support programs, uh, particularly targeting those with mental health and or disabilities. Um, and here is a, a photo of our lovely report with the QR code. And uh, don't worry, the QR code, if you can't grab it in time, it will be on later slides for your reading purposes. Next slide, please. Perfect acknowledgements. Next slide, thanks, Sri. Perfect. Now, the structure of today, um, I'm aiming to summarize the key findings, our first report of the GoLab evaluation of the Mental Health Employment Partnership, which is commissioned under the Life Chances Fund. So I'll be going through, you know, introduction, methods, findings, and conclusion. Now, on our next slide, and the next slide, I'll jump into more of the introduction of MHEP. So as Sarah said, the Mental Health and Employment Partnership or MHEP was established in 2015 to drive the expansion of high quality employment support intervention, which is known as Individual Placement and Support or IPS. So there are five social impact bonds that are contracted under the Life Chances Fund through this MHEP project. Um, and these are Haringey and Barnett, Shropshire, Enfield, Tower Hamlets for the Mental Health Cohort and Tower Hamlets for the Learning Disability Cohort. Now on our next slide, just to recap the sort of service that's within these social impact bonds. So IPS as the intervention, it involves integrating employment specialists within health teams to optimize return to work. 
So the MHEP projects support people experiencing mental health issues and learning disabilities, or all in learning disabilities, sorry, to find and remain in competitive and paid work. So IPS services are quite unique that they do not exclude people on the basis of diagnosis, symptoms, or substance misuse on these key principles, which are zero exclusion, unlimited support, and integrated services. Now on our next slide, in terms of the social impact bonds, as Sarah kindly said, MHEP is a special purpose vehicle which is run by social finance. So what does this mean? It's a legal entity um, which is created solely for a financial transaction or to fulfill a specific contractual objective. And as many of us know, special purpose vehicles are sometimes used to structure um, impact bonds. Um, so in terms of the five social impact bonds within MHEP, these all meet the definition of an impact bond used by Indigo or the International Network for Data on Impact and Government Outcomes. So what is this definition of an impact bond? Basically, for anyone that doesn't know, it's a contractual relationship that includes two core factors. So the first is a payment for outcomes achieved, so aka an outcome contract. And the second core factor is upfront repayable finance provided by a third party of which the repayment is partially or fully conditional on this achievement of the outcomes. Now, in the next slide, we'll talk about the outcomes that are tied to payment in the MHEP social impact bonds. So there are three pre-specified measurable outcomes that are tied to payment in these impact bonds. The first one is engagement. So this is the individual or, or client users that engage with the IPS services and they complete a vocational profile of aspirations of paid work, of previous paid work, et cetera. Um, the second is job starts, so that the individual spends one full day or four hours of part-time work in paid competitive employment. And thirdly, job sustainment, so an individual sustains paid competitive employment for at least 13 weeks. Now, on the next slide, we can see these five uh, social impact bonds and the, uh, the cohorts. So as Sarah said, four of them are targeting people with serious mental illness, while the last one is targeting um, learning disabilities. Um, and we can also see um, the service delivery dates, all of them starting quite close to COVID. And we will talk about that later in the, um, in the presentation. You can also see the separate providers and we're really fortunate to have a provider voice on the panel for our second part today, um, Oliver from Twining Enterprise. And also in the later uh, section of the table, we can see these um, targets that have been set for these three payable outcomes, as well as referral, which is um, just a handy thing to have for performance. Now on the next slide, I would just want to quickly talk about the actors of social impact bonds, because sometimes um, it can be quite confusing for a sort of an external to understand who's who, who is doing what, et cetera. Um, so firstly, we have social finance. It is a co-commissioner. Um, it functions as an intermediary, it manages the performance and the contract, um, and it also houses this special purpose vehicle. Um, secondly, we have Big Issue Invest. So Big Issue Invest is the investor or the investment fund manager. So what does this mean? They provide the upfront social investment, which is channeled through MHEP, which is the working capital or um, the setup capital for these impact bonds. Um, Next, we have the providers which deliver the service or deliver um, IPS. So these are Enable, Working Well Trust, Twining Enterprise, and JET. Um, next, we have the local commissioners. So what do local commissioners do in this situation? Well, they provide the majority of outcome payments if the outcomes are achieved. Um, and we also have Life Chances Fund. So Life Chances Fund provides a minority contribution to outcome payments. So they are indeed co-payers of outcomes. But in fact, the outcome contracts themselves are housed at the local level. Um, what is interesting is that the MHEP project is required to provide regular updates on the progress to the Life Chances Fund, um, uh, which includes quarterly, annual, and end of award monitoring through the Life Chances uh, Fund data platform. Now, the next slide just briefly touches on the structure of the um, MHEP projects, which is definitely included in the report. So if you are interested on more of the structure and the design, feel free to um, have a read. Now, on the next slide, I want to talk about the methods. And on the next slide, there is a question. So 
this report is the first of three planned reports, which we're super fortunate um, to have um, this opportunity for deeper analysis. So it is a longitudinal evaluation and it approaches a uh, uses a mixed methods approach. So overall question is, did the MHEP social impact bonds, specifically the outcome contracts and or the performance management function, make a difference to the outcomes achieved compared to alternative commissioning approaches? And so what mechanisms do the social impact bonds do and, and, and how is this contributing to, to improved impacts if that is the case? And also do the benefits of a SIB or using a SIB outweigh the costs? So this is what we're really trying to nail down with this evaluation. And we're super fortunate to have um, Eleanor Carter, our research director at GoLab, um, who will also be on the panel. So if you have any more questions about this evaluation strategy, feel free to um, ask her some questions. Now on the next slide, so why are we are evaluating MHEP? Um, why, what is so special about the MHEP case study? So MHEP is being evaluated as part of our supplementary evaluation or the LCF supplementary evaluation, sorry, which involves a deep dive or in-depth studies into certain projects, which look to directly compare the use of SIBs to alternative commissioning mechanisms. Um, so MHEP provides a useful project for this because number one, it delivers a tightly defined intervention, IPS, um, and it also has been delivered through other commissioning models in the NHS. So through this approach, we really can access um, the extent to which the social impact bonds is contributing to outcomes achieved. So on the next slide, this is just sort of the summary of what I'm talking about of, of why MHEP is unique and why it's an optimal evaluation site. Firstly, it delivers this international established evidence-based intervention IPS, as we've said before, it has a well-defined validated fidelity scale, which is an extremely handy analytical tool for us. Um, and IPS has been subject to, to national and, and international um, uh, research on, on uh, showing the effectiveness of it compared to other sort of vocational programs. Um, and this differs to other social impact bonds, which are testing new interventions. Um, so this provides a slightly um, ad advantageous um, sort of element. Um, the second point is that it has an existing live comparator. So IPS is being uh, delivered through non-social impact bond contracts. So con traditional commissioned IPS. Um, and this has been uh, in 350 sites across the UK um, due to the national commitment to scale up IPS in the NHS through the long-term plan. Um, and we also have um, uh, Julia from IPS Grow here, who is willing and happy to talk about the scale up of IPS. Um, and this differs to other social impact bonds, which, which lack a robust um, counterfactual and, and lack a live um, comparator site. So we're super fortunate. Um, and the last point is that MHIP is a large social impact bond project and has a high number of project participants. So as Sarah said, over 10,000 people since 2015, since the conception have been going through these um, services. And this compares to other LCF projects which are slightly more small and other social impact bond projects internationally, which are slightly more pilots or a bit more smaller scale. So in terms of the next slide, thanks Sri. Um, so phase one is the analysis of the preliminary performance of these social impact bonds. It talks about the distinctive contribution of MHEP as a co-commissioner and how that differs to traditional commissioners. Um, and it also finally talks about the facilitators and barriers um, in terms of the external influences on implementing social impact bonds, as well as the theory of change of how MHEP is interacting with all its stakeholders. And as I said before, it is a um, first of many reports. So we have phase two and phase three reports. Um, so currently we are um, on the way to uh, writing and completing these as well. So stay tuned. And uh, in our next slide, I will jump straight into the methods of this report. Thank you. So as I said, generating theories of change, exploring the distinct contribution of MHEP and analyzing the performance of key outcome metrics through time and across different sites and providers. So these are our three aims. Now on our next slide, this is our report. We are super excited. It was recently published in March this year. Um, feel free to uh, put your phone over the QR code. This links to the um, UK government website, which has not only executive summary of two pages, very quick, easy read, as well as a juicy, juicy report, as Andrea said. Um, so definitely some Sunday reading. Now, in terms of what 
uh, is in this report, we have included analysis and collection through documentary analysis, through board reports, um, and through the LCF um, data platform. We've also included theory, three theory of change workshop, workshop, sorry, with each stakeholder. So this is the commissioners, this is the providers, and this is social finance that are involved in this project. We've also included 22 interviews with all of these stakeholders in the report, um, as well as the mid-term performance analysis, which is from the start of the social impact bonds to um, the end of 2021. Now, in terms of the next slide, we can see the range of qualitative collection. We have done quite a co comprehensive um, sort of sweep of qualitative uh, sort of collection methods. You know, we've done um, the interviews, we've done observations, we've done a theory of change workshops, and we've done a couple of observations as well, just to give a bit more colour um, and, and really get into to the understanding of what are the MHEP social impact bonds doing compared to other alternative commissioning approaches. And on the next slide, we can see the distribution of interviewees. You know, we have 22 uh, total interviews, but this is really quite evenly spread across the service providers um, that we have, the commissioners, as well as the MHEP teams, um, TNLCF and the investor through Big Issue Invest. Now on the next slide, we can see the quantitative component. Um, so we have collated and merged primarily, um, primary and secondary data from multiple sources and created a single main data set. Um, you know, we've extracted project performance from social finance, the DCMS data portal. Um, we've also collected um, the Oxford COVID-19 government tracker. Um, and we've also collected IPS effectiveness data from the literature to see how MHEP SIBs um, are, are compared to sort of other uh, SIB performance, I mean, other IPS performances, apologies. In terms of analysis, this was mainly through descriptive project level outcome analysis, um, and this is through the time and across the different SIB projects within the um, within MHEP. Um, and also to measure performance, we didn't just want to look at the outcome achievement, we want to have a bit more of a wider success. So we, we developed two metrics to capture this success beyond just simple outcome counts. Um, so what are these? These are success rate, and this is conversion rate. So success rate is the ratio of the number of outcomes that are achieved by um, the number of targets that were set initially. And then the outcome conversion rate is the rate that one type of outcome converts into another that follows it. So for example, engagement to job starts or job starts to sustainment. Um, so this is a standardized metric and job outcome rate is widely used in measuring the effectiveness of um, IPS. Now in terms in the next slide, we'll jump straight into the results. So firstly, we have our theory of change. Our theory of change connects inputs to eventual outcomes, and it also unpacks mechanisms which help MHEP transform its inputs into both short-term and long-term outcomes. So this figure summarizes the theory of change that was agreed and shared by all three stakeholder groups. Um, so this is the local commissioners, this is the providers, and this is the MHEP. So we can see through the bold here that the, M, that the MHEP provides inputs of support through convening and advocacy, um, analytical inputs and support, and operational uh, input and support. And this leads to mechanisms of change or mediating mechanisms, which is additional financial and human resources, collaborative way of working, and additional performance management. And so on our next slide, we'll jump straight into kind of what, what does this mean? So there were diverse views on whether MHEP was distinctive over traditional commissioning. But across all of these stakeholders, they managed to agree on three functions. As I said before, additional financial and human resources that the SIB was providing compared to working with local authorities, so non-SIB approaches. The second thing that was distinct was a more collaborative way of working. And thirdly, this additional performance management, which is not something that is um, uh, quite a, a new finding. You know, we know that additional performance management has been um, sort of found or revealed in other so social impact bond projects. So in terms of the next slide, I'll go just slightly more into this. So additional financial and human resources, what does this mean? So MHEP provided access um, to social impact bond and life chance fund funding. Um, which IPS providers would not have been able to receive otherwise without this social impact bond. 
Um, so this meant that it was able to boost local capacity and enable additional employment specialists to be hired. So one provided revealed to me that, um, you know, two employment specialists were able to be hired due to this additional funding that was provided through the social impact bond, which meant a, 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 an abundance of extra service users that they could, um, you know, uh, of service and, and, and help improve their, their, their well-being and their, and their lifestyle and their um, get access to paid competitive employment. Um, the second one is collaborative uh, way of working. So MHEP was described as a three-way partnership. It was described as a relational approach. It was described as increasing accountability. But what underpinned this was shared purpose and shared values, which is something that a lot of us um, truly kind of understand. Um, and even though that this collaborative way of working through the social impact bond was considerable work, according to our interviews, where there was an initial setup in terms of trust building um, and, and, and showing, you know, what is MHEP doing in terms of performance management and how is it different to traditional commissioners? However, despite this initial work, it was viewed as hugely beneficial. And lastly, with the additional performance management, what do we mean? So MHEP provided a dedicated performance management function, and this was seen to drive an additional focus on achieving outcomes. So this took the form of regular and rigorous scrutiny through the MHEP team as part of the social impact bond contract, which was on top of the provider's internal processes. So this was grounded in more analytical capacity and data, um, and particularly granular data and benchmarking. However, there were some concerns about heightened reporting requirements, and this was descri described as inter with, um, uh, from interviewees as layers of reporting, in which they had to report to MHEP, to their commissioner, um, to the Mental Health Employment Service data set, um, NHS England spreadsheets. Um, so there was quite a bit of reporting. However, we know and we understand now that that has actually reduced over time. Now, the next slide I think is probably the most interesting um, to me is, is MHEP distinctive compared to traditional commissioning? Yes, no, let's get into it. So firstly, in terms of yes, it is distinctive, I'll go on to the positive distinctions. Um, so data analytics intelligence and performance management seem to drive additional focus compared to working with local authorities. Secondly, the working culture um, was very effective um, compared to local authorities. And interviewees described that working with local authorities were a little bit more paternalistic um, than MHEP, and while MHEP was a bit more peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and lastly, the positive distinction is that MHEP identified LCF funding opportunities, which add financial resources to these projects, which help them have a bit more of a sustainable perspective and not struggle on sort of year-to-year -year contracts. Um, however, in terms of the negative distinctions, due to the different backgrounds, MHEP approach was considered a little bit theoretical by some interviewees. Um, they found that sometimes it was removed from the practicalities of local IPS delivery. Um, and this was often due to the use of different technical language and jargon. Um, in terms of no, there, there isn't a distinction. What we found is that some uh, interviewees found that it wasn't marketably additional to existing practices and performance management within local authorities, but um, GoLab is currently looking into um, whether or not that the people that said that there was no distinction, whether or not they just had slightly better baseline performance management. Now, terms in the next slide, in terms of the common facilitators and barriers, the common facilitator among all was that there was an alignment of these contracts with wider IPS commissioning. So the KPIs included in MHEP, MHEP pardon me, was perceived to align with both the previous contracts and employment support and the national IPS rollout, which means that there was a sense of familiarity, which definitely helped. Um, what I do want to note, which I think is really important, is that while interviewees identified a variety of different facilitators, Service providers only identified two, um, and they could identify a, a wide range of barriers um, and you know, other interviewees identified a wide range of facilitators, but service providers could only identify two. And we thought this was interesting. However, this may not be surprising given that the providers are largely shielded from the inner workings of the social impact bonds. Nevertheless, it could also mean they were the stakeholder that bore the brunt of the initial complexity of implementing a service funded through this new way of working. 
So this may suggest that they need to be more adequately supported through the initial learning curve of using a social impact bond mechanism. We hope that this finding can help other social impact bond projects, um, you know, help with the setup and, uh, and better sort of support and, and uh, these, these providers. In terms of the next slide, there were three main common barriers. And this was that the payment structures was perceived as complex and unfamiliar that the cohort differences meant that users with this, the learning disability cohort required longer and more intensive support. And it also represented a fixed population which limited referrals. Um, and thirdly, that COVID-19 has significantly affected project performance and outcomes. Now, terms in the next slide, I'm just gonna go deeper into this complexity point because I think this complexity as a barrier to social impact bond is really fascinating to me. Um, so the SIBs were perceived as complex, but in two, for two reasons. And the first is the complex in payment. So what does this mean? So it means that the splitting or the balancing between the outcome-based payments and the block payments was slightly unfamiliar to them. And secondly, through the design. So the design of the outcome metrics, which, which are the core of the social impact bonds. So under these MHEP projects, it's only possible to claim one payment for each job start regardless of whether the participants are supported into multiple or separate jobs. Um, so a second job start is not classified as a payable outcome, but it's actually covered under sustainment outcome. And that was an initial sort of confusion for these IPS providers. Now, in terms of the next slide, you know, we know that social impact bonds, that payment by outcomes is a key feature. However, unlike other projects and unlike extreme payment by results contracts, um, MHEP payment arrangements blend both block and uh, outcome payments. So this means that there's no, there's not a full exposure to non-payment in situations of poor performance. So the exact split of payment uh, arrangements um, vary across the projects. So this range from 70 to 30 or 95 to five. So what that means is sometimes it goes 30% outcome payments versus 5% outcome payments for some, uh, some of these social impact bonds. What was also um, good to note is that blending funding from the Life Chances Fund and the local commissioner, as well as the splitting the outcome-based payments and the block payments, meant that the payment flows were unfamiliar to providers and that the need to calculate bespoke payments, um, depending on the outcome achievement, rather than just set levels every time, this added to the complexity of invoicing for MHEP. So having to calculate and, and, and really be mindful of, you know, the payments that were really just only for the outcomes achieved um, adds to this complexity as we all know. Now turn to the next slide. So, so what, what is the point? So basically the MHEP um, interviewees said that a healthy amount of pressure was described as ideal um, to manage this financial risk easier and take on more contracts. Um, because as, as we all know, people are slightly more risk adverse. Um, and what we found is that several MHEP team members and providers stated that this ideal, this preference, was this 95% block and 5% outcomes. And this was uh, perceived to generate sufficient incentive um, for them. Now, in terms of the next slide, just a little bit more into the complexity about the factors. Um, so when would there be a difference in discomfort at a higher outcome payment uh, ratio? So we found the interviewee said that during a crisis and the pandemic, they you know, would not be comfortable uh, relying on outcome-based, uh, a higher outcome-based payment. We also found that smaller providers, so there was a concern that if performance-based uh, payments become more mainstream, that smaller third sector providers in the longer term may struggle, even if they may be you know, more suited to deliver um, better outcomes for that area. We also found that providers with less reserves would feel slightly more uncomfortable with a higher ratio. Um, and we also found that different roles within provider organizations. So providers um, that were more in senior management roles definitely preferred um, a higher outcome-based payment because it's clearer for defining outcomes and it's really um, clear on what to measure. In terms of the next slide, what did commissioners think of all this? So commissioners actually reflected quite positively on the payment arrangements, um, and it made them consider using outcome-based payments in their mix of the contracting options for future projects. So we, hear, we have here one local commissioner, um, he stated, or they stated the experience from having done outcome-based payment by results, um, I would look to adopt that model as part of the contracting financial mix. 
However, they would go back and they would firstly try and understand the probability of this model in delivering outcomes. They'd also want to recheck the likely success of integration for referral pathways and also its setting, um, because we know that this would influence the extent, um, you know, success. And, and these three factors would, would influence major, uh, majorly his uh, probability of loading payments against outcomes in his future commissioning contracts. Now, I'll just briefly um, run through the performance um, results on the next slide. So for performance, early performance data finds that NHEP social impact bonds were performing below initial targets um, up to the period of December 2021. However, these targets were set prior to the pandemic. Um, and we know um, through our analysis currently that the job outcomes and sustainment rates have improved um, quite dramatically since. What is interesting that changes were made to support projects during this difficult um, sort of time and difficult performance in the pandemic, such as COVID related activity payments. And I'm happy to talk about that further in, in, the, in the panel or, or questions. Um, and the other major sort of performance finding was that among participants with severe mental illness, the job outcome rate, so this conversion rate um, was 29%. So this is actually similar to the lower end of the normal that's seen in IPS implementation literature, which is generally around 30% to 50%. Now on the next slide, we can see um, sort of color coded of the uh, sort of success rates. So you can see from yellow and red, this does hint at underperformance, but these were initial uh, high case scenarios or ambitious targets set prior to the pandemic. Um, and on the next slide, we can see the conversion rates. You can see the conversion rate slightly more green colored, um, success rates were quite decent. Um, and we can see that you know, from this, it's quite uh, self-explanatory that 29% is, 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 is on the lower end of normal. Um, in the IPS, uh, IPS implement, implementation literature, apologies. So on the next slide, just a quick summary of the performance. Overall analysis of the outcome rates, we find that quarterly performance appears to be below expectations, um, often around 50% of anticipated targets. Um, success rates in meeting job outcome targets have remained uh, quite a, a similar level over time. Um, job outcome rates at 29%, which is within normal, and with respect to outcome-based uh, you know, composition, more than 65% of all achievements for the severe mental illness cohort was actually on engagements, which is an interesting finding. Um, but the one thing I want you to take away is that performance against these targets has is massively been affected by the COVID uh, dis uh, disruptions. Now on my last slide here, I'm just gonna briefly touch on um, you know, why is this NHEP case study or why is this NHEP evaluation, why it might be relevant for you and what you can take away from it. Um, and we hope that you sort of stay tuned to us to other additional reports that are coming in, in due time. So firstly, the NHEP project, it is an example of how to scale and replicate uh, impact bonds. So since 2015, since the conception, NHEP is a special purpose vehicle um, you know, six contracts under an additional outcome fund, which is a CBO and um, social outcome fund, as well as five contracts under the life chance fund. All of them have very similar parameters in its contracts. So we found that the special purpose vehicles actually delivered quite cookie cutter like approaches. Um, and this is seen as quite convenient and reducing transaction costs um, and, uh, you know, helps with institutional memory and, and it's just slightly more easier to roll out. Um, and some providers, Twining and Working Well Trust, have worked under MHEP um, since its conception, which I think is an interesting um, observation. Secondly, MHEP is an example of how to scale up evidence-based interventions. And we're really curious of whether or not we can find, um, can social impact bonds be an effective contracting tool for evidence-based interventions? Um, mm. Thirdly, uh, NHEP is an example of how low outcome-based payment ratios is, is existing um, and how this compares to historical extreme payment by results. Um, and you know, gives an example to people that might uh, be struggling about how to set this, this ratio. Um, and Sarah Bailey has some uh, excellent understanding um, and insight on, on how MHEP has over time found uh, that this sort of unique uh, threshold um, has come about. Uh, fourthly, the NHEP project it tackled big questions in the social impact bond space, as Andrea said in the first um, part of this webinar. So it tackles value added. So 
So can social impact bonds perform better than other contracting arrangements in terms of the social outcomes achieved and do the benefits outweigh the cost? And we're super excited to, to answer this um, very, very shortly in our next reports. Um, and lastly, MHEP is an example of investing in health and social care, which we think, you know, I'm especially interested in, I hope everyone on this webinar is also especially interested in. Um, and it also, it, it shows an example of how to tackle healthier lives through, through social determinants of health, which we know is good paid employment. Um, so I'm very fortunate to be um, evaluated on this project um, and work with amazing people, um, particularly those on our panel. Um, so I will pass back to the chair and thank you so much. Emily, thank you so much for that absolutely brilliant presentation. Um, I've you know, heard you give a version of that presentation at least three times, and I still feel like it's an awful lot to take in. So thank you for presenting everything so clearly. Um, I think everything you've covered, you know, like really shows the complexity of the MHE program itself, but also the complexity of the evaluation agenda. And, you know, I saw comments in the chat. Thank you, Elle, for picking up some of the questions around the evaluation approach. I know we've had to be creative and work with a, a whole range of organizations to get where we are. And, and when we, in a moment, come into the panel discussion, I'll invite Elle to say a few more words about kind of what next and perhaps also how this specific evaluation of the MHEP program fits within our wider evaluation of the Life Chances Fund. Um, I saw a couple of few actual actually comments and questions in the chat around the outcome payments and the balance between the block payments versus outcome. Thank you, Alan and Sarah, for clarifying some of those questions. For, for those of you who are maybe like struggling to multitask and listening to the speaker and also reading the questions at the same time, uh, Sarah, perhaps before I introduce the other guest speakers, would you like to just give a, an overview, kind of share a bit more about the outcome payments and how that works? And I think your distinction in the comments around the uh, outcomes to uh, sorry outcome payments to MHEP versus the actual payments to providers is a really important one so can I come to you for a bit more detail on that yeah sure um just wanted to make a, yeah a quick clarification point because I know it it certainly confused me when we first started this work um that the split that Emily was talking about around 70 30 up to 95 to 5 um is the split between block payments and outcome payments from MPEP to the providers of the services. Um, and as Emily mentioned, we've tested lots of different versions of those ratios through time through our MPEP SIBs. And um, the ratio we've ended up on, I mean, it varies and it definitely depends on the provider's appetite for that type of payment and other things. But we've found that when the payments are skewed too heavily towards outcome payments to providers, it can um, mess up the incentives that the providers have to deliver a really high fidelity IPS service. So if you're um, if you're focusing too much on our quite narrow outcome metrics, um, you might be they might be cherry picking, they might be you're not delivering services to the people that need it the most. So that's sort of the point that we've ended up on. In terms of MPEP as a vehicle, we receive outcome payments from our local and national outcomes funders. And it's then the investor that bears the brunt of underperformance and the lack of repayment of their loans rather than underperformance impacting the provider's ability to deliver the service in the moment. I don't know if, that, if that's helpful. To me, that's just a bit of detail on that front. Okay. Yeah, brilliant. That is really helpful. I know there's an awful lot more detail in the evaluation report itself. So I think if anyone on the call right now still has questions, I'll perhaps uh, go to the full report uh, next. Uh, Sarah, can I keep you on for another question? I, I'm really curious, and you know, you've mentioned this and Emily discussed this as well in her presentation, the five different impact bond projects um, delivered locally. I just wonder if you could say a bit more about the variations across the, the five projects. And I'm thinking about the kind of, you know, impact of the local context. Do each of the five projects look quite similar and operate in quite similar ways? I'm thinking like 
cohort groups and so on, like involvement of the co-commissioner at local level and so on. So the first part of the question is how different do these projects look like and feel like in practice? Um, and then maybe a joint question perhaps for Sarah and Emily, again, thinking about the variations across the five projects. Um, what's been the experience of the stakeholders in the five projects? Um, so with the surveys, for example, Emily, is it like across the board similar responses or was the experience of one particular uh, set of stakeholders in a particular impact bond quite different for uh, that of stakeholders in one of the other four? Thanks, Andrea. I'll speak to the, the first question first. So it was around kind of the different contexts. So, as I mentioned at the start, we had four London boroughs um, and one service in, in Shropshire. Um, I think we certainly experienced differences across those areas um, in terms of the impact of COVID on the labour markets. I think the labour markets reopening was quite different across the different areas across London versus in Shropshire. So I think Shropshire found a slower recovery of their labour market, which impacted their ability to achieve job outcomes for the people that they serve. So we, we certainly ex, um, experienced that difference. And the labour market is quite different in terms of the jobs that are available. Um, in each of the specific local contexts, the, the relationships between the providers and the commissioners are all slightly different, which I think did lead us to have slightly different discussions across our different um, providers I think each context is going through their own particular um, changes and as Ollie has very detailed knowledge of um, different CCGs in certain areas have merged which has led to quite complex relationships with the commissioners in different areas so I think during our contract with Twinings we had two or three CCGs merging into one, which made discussions with commissioners really difficult because they were changing, their contract management processes were changing, um, which led to, to quite different relationships versus um, other areas. And some were commissioned by um, CCGs, some by local councils, which had a different feel. And specifically in Shropshire, we had quite a unique setting where the provider enable is actually a part of the local authority. So they are... Um, not a separate sort of third sector organization they're within the council which meant that we could have kind of different discussions about um, success and different ways that we could influence the service but it also meant that the incentives were all quite different because your commissioner and your service provider are actually under the one umbrella and I will leave the second question to Emily and she can bring me in if she needs any help oh thanks Sarah that sounds great um Absolutely, there's a lot of variation among the sites. And I think one that I really want to talk about is um, the cohort, because um, I think that's a, a really main uh, key finding that came out of this report. Um, so as we know that the Tower Hamlet site, um, their social impact bond, um, they were delivering IPS for the learning disability cohort. Um, so both providers and commissioners uh, in this SIB as well as other SIB noted that the learning disability services require different expertise and different intensiveness on the support um, that was required. Um, so this meant that, you know, greater staffing needs, it's, it takes longer to acquire an appropriate job with them, uh, for them, sorry, with proper accommodations. Um, and this differs for the, the mental health cohort where interviewees said that the mental health cohort is more likely to have masters and they're more likely to apply, uh, be able to apply for a wider range of jobs. Um, compared to the learning disabilities, which actually has a ceiling on, on the type of role, roles that they're able to apply for. Um, so, yeah, basically the, the suitable job market was appeared to be thinner for people with learning disability cohort. Um, people with learning disabilities have higher unemployment rates, which is slightly more difficult. Um, and the journey from referral to achieving a job start takes longer. Um, the other thing in terms of variation is that I, I think our report is really fantastic on, on showing the diversity of the different stakeholders um, and, and particularly with a the theory of change, um, for example, um, service providers were talking about uh, support in terms of more adaptiveness and stability of services um, and contract management support, um, while the MHEP team actually found that the project was a success because of um, pooled financial arrangements, um, which harmonizes this local and national funding. So I think um, it's really interesting to see that the, the benefits that came out of the interviewees 
um, was different across the different stakeholders and it was based on the ability to improve that stakeholder's job. That's really interesting. Thank you, Emily and Sarah and Elle for picking up so many questions in the chat. We've got about half an hour left together. So at this point, I would like to bring into the discussion three additional guests who have agreed to join us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Julia from IPS Grow, Oli from one of the provider organizations at Twining Enterprise involved in the MHEP program and our research director, Elle. Um, a warm welcome to all three of you. Can I kindly introduce, uh, ask each one of you to introduce yourselves, Julia, Oli, and Elle, and then we'll jump straight in through the discussion. And there are three particular things that I hope we can pick up on in the discussion. A, the kind of collaborative working point, and Oli in particular, it'd be great to hear from you as one of the providers. What does that look like um, in practice? What's been the experience? I guess both the sort of value added and perhaps some of the challenges, the focus on performance. And I think here, the comparison and the links to IPS grow is something that would be really interesting to explore. Uh, and then lastly, sustainability kind of, um, Sarah, the slides you were telling us about the very comprehensive um, evidence building agenda behind MHEP. Um, how is that feeding into wider conversation at national level, um, influencing policy and thinking about project delivery beyond the life chances fund. But over to Julia, Oli and Elle first for very quick introductions. Thanks, Andrea. Um, thanks, everybody, for letting me join today. Um, I'm Julia Stapleton, IPS Grow Lead for London. I've been in that role uh, since uh, uh, IPS Grow started in early 2019. Uh, but prior to that, I worked for the DWP uh, as a senior a lead community partner, working across uh, a number of districts, or, sorry, a number of job centres, I should say, uh, to support their, uh, their the culture of supporting people with disabilities better. Um, I, my background in IPS is I was lucky enough to work for the very first trust in the UK that introduced IPS, so that's South West London St George's in my current patch in London. Um, and actually, I think I've been uh, another sort of lens uh, to the work that I do in that um, I also received IPS services in that trust. Um, and that uh, was why I ended up doing this work in the first place. So I feel very passionately that um, we're looking at how we sustain uh, IPS services. Oh, that's brilliant and such a privilege to have your uh, expertise on the panel, Julia. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Ollie Jacobs from Twining. We're a mental health and employment charity going since 1995 and working across Northwest London. I think we've run every contract under the sun in that time. So happy to feed back the intricacies of, of all of that as we go through our conversation. Hi everyone, my name's Elle Carter. I'm Research Director with the Government Outcomes Lab team at the Blavatnik School of Government. And I'm really excited to join this panel for, for two reasons. I sense that there's quite a lot of um, experience and maybe frustration with the more mainstream commissioning of employment support contracts. That's something that I've researched a lot in the past and has been really problematic and troubling in terms of the poor supports in mainstream employment services for people experiencing mental health issues. So I come with a real frustration around a lot of the payment by results uh, landscape um, that we've experienced in the UK previously. Um, and so I'm excited uh, that we've got some projects here that, that actually propose quite a different model, albeit still focused on outcomes, but that are really much more person-centered in the approach. And then the second reason is it gives us a great opportunity to grow the evidence base around impact bonds in a way that we haven't been able to do previously because of this potential to look at the different accountability approaches and management styles that we see in the impact bond backed IPS services versus the more mainstream national rollout. So I'm excited for a kind of, this can change outcomes for people, but also the nerd in me is very excited too. Fab, thank you. Um, oh, right, so let's dig in because Emily, you've so beautifully explained in your presentation some of the kind of key uh, benefits, I suppose, that were highlighted through your research, collaborative working, focus on performance and accountability. But it'd just be really great to hear from those directly involved in delivery and management of MHEP, what that actually looks like in practice and what it means and how is it different uh, from more traditional way, ways of funding the services. So Oli, can I come to you 
you first place. You've mentioned your amazing experience uh, in, in the sector. So it'd be great to have your reflections. What does this collaborative working um, mean and, and look like in practice for you as a provider organization? Um, and I think just, yeah, more generally your reflections around what's been different um, in working through the MHA program. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the nature of these things is is fairly complex. And as you sort of run through commissioning cycles and look to get things mobilized all the way through the field, I think the work with MHEP has been invaluable in sort of knitting all the partners together and just giving that sense actually of mutual accountability um, through the process. Often in you know our traditional commissioning environments, there's a sort of rush to get things tendered commissioned and then commissioners may be naturally busy other things to do tend to sort of leave it and flop a little bit and pop up a little bit kind of later down the process so it's kind of held the glue together to have good productive thorough um, conversations about how the program will sort of look and develop and to the theme that's already been mentioned I guess the sort of professionalism of the data analytics the ability to track things um, you know, traffic light systems and things like that, of course, not rocket science, but sometimes they don't get always integrated into kind of performance conversations. So that's been um, immensely helpful. And I would say our experience with MHEP is having a real sort of champion through the process. So our work is difficult and involved. Um, some of the contracting processes, I mean, we sometimes have to deliver services without having a contract in place, although we're told it's coming. Sometimes we haven't had payments till eight months into the kind of project year. So weathering those things through together um, has been um, helpful um, in the process. Um, the other thing I would say, just as a general point in the, of what some of the been presented here, it's interesting to try and tease out, or well, it's quite difficult actually, what different contracts can offer. So some of the things around SIB versus non-SIB and counterfactuals, because I'm not so sure it's that easy to differentiate that stark differential because of those factors, just because there are other variables involved. You know, it's how the thing was contracted, um, complexity of contract. Has there been a history of an IPS service in that borough or is it starting from scratch? Um, how the contracting cycle works. So is it one year, one year, one year, one year contracts versus, for example, in the NHS, if you're running IPS, you know, you probably have your funding, maybe you go for 10 years, you have it year on year and committed and all the things that come into that process in terms of staff retention, pressures on the project and the uncertainty at the end of the year, is it going to continue the next year and all the rest of it do have an impact. So you know, if you have a solid IPS service that's commissioned and committed to over sort of five or 10 years, you've gone through the setup, you're building from there, then you'll get into those higher echelons of the 30 to 50% kind of employment ratio. But some of the sort of stable ground for a lot of the contracts we run is just kind of simply not there. So that's a reflection there. And the other point I would make is um, my understanding of certainly maybe government one description or other don't necessarily want to take the risk on a project and so they might want through a sib to prove you know have it proven that it works and then they'll sort of commission it kind of in the long term and pick it up so our experience has been that we're sort of getting there but that sort of track hasn't been set and it's been quite a sort of jumpy journey and i think these sort of buttressing processes whether it's mhep um or the sort of sib model kind of replaces the absence of working deeply with the whole commissioning environment as it is through government of good quality commissioning, commissioners knowing, you know, their brief, the sort of intricacies of their local market, high quality commissioning going out um, with respect to targets and, and modeling uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and what else did I want to say on that? Um, and government having an attitude indeed to kind of take risks and have things fail and go through that process as well. So yeah, I'll, a couple of reflections there and we'll leave it for the moment. Yeah. That's really helpful, Ollie. I just wanted to add a few things on that because I think that that's a really, a really useful framing of this and a way that MHIP in some ways is shielded and isn't shielded from some of those normal cycles of commissioning. I know that across the SIBs that we have within MHIP, the even just the duration as you spoke about there is different across all of them right so the the sib that that ollie and i have worked on and in, in Herringay and barnett was in a two plus two structure of 
two years and then a review point and then two more years. And that review point caused yourselves, us, so much work to try and get that contract re-signed, whereas some of the others were for four years and we didn't have that. So I think it's a really good point when thinking about those other non-SIB sites as comparatives is how similar can we align some of those contracting structures to see, to kind of remove the impact of some of those elements of it. Um, and I think that the the other element to that, to the your second point there around the context you might use a SIB commissioning model. And I think MHEP's approach, as I sort of outlined in the start, was we sort of see the SIB structure as a place to test and learn things, to, as you say, fund something that might not otherwise have been funded because we can draw on the central funding. So the local commissioners sort of willing to take more of a risk on it. Our original intention wasn't to see it as a long-term option for commissioning these services. Um, and in some, there are some elements of it that you can see through this evaluation that are successful, but you can see some elements of it that are harder to run over the long term. Even just MHEP as a central element in this web is expensive to run, right? So there's there's already additional costs that you might not normally want to have involved in your commissioning structure. So I think it's it's a really useful framing to, to see what is the right context to use it for? What's the value that it's added in the places we've used it? And then what else are the other places that you might be wanting to, to apply a similar approach, whether it is testing or learning or bringing central funding that you might not have otherwise been able to achieve? Well, thank you, Oli and Sarah, for really underscoring the importance of recognizing the complexity of the commissioning landscape, both at local and national level. And I think also the, the complexity and challenges we face as, as GoLab in trying to isolate, if you like, this SIP effect, given the, the wider context of these programs. Just one other question on uh, collaboration, and then we'll move on to, to Julia and kind of like bring in the IPS grow experience as well and how that relates to MHEP. Could you say a few words about the relationship with the local commissioners and kind of like their role um, in, in, in these collaborative structures? I think Sarah or Oli or both. I'll leave that one to Oli to start with. I think he's got much more experience of working with local commissioners than me. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I think one of the pieces has been through the process is changed in turnover um, of commissioners through the process. So <laughs> when you've got the nature of the complexity of these types of things, inducting local commissioners back into sort of three massive document co-commissioning kind of agreements and enabling them to get a handle on that um, has been quite challenging. Um, I think equally, whilst we've had these regular meetings, at times we've had commissioners that haven't turned up or, you know, got involved. So sometimes that's been a bit challenging. So not limited to this particular piece, but I think generally, to my earlier point, sort of getting commissioners really kind of fully engaged, you know, right through the process um, has, has been a a challenging affair so sometimes you know maybe they felt they can leave a little bit to MHEP to sort of manage and not come on and sort of follow through um on the on the full piece so I think that that's been a, a challenging aspect you know we've had people who we've known for years who you know have been part of this and have dropped in and been sort of great help but uh the the general piece has been been quite a tricky landscape yeah but that's really interesting so then kind of MHEP acting or providing that continuity uh, I suppose, not, not just of the funding, but the expertise and the kind of bringing yeah. commissioners along. Excellent. Right. Um, if there are any other questions around the collab collaborative working, please drop them in the chat and we'll, we'll try to cover them in the last 12 minutes and we've got together. But Julia, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. In her presentation, Sarah's alluded to the, the distinction and, and between MHEB and IPS Grow. Uh, but could you say a few more words about uh, IPS Grow and you know, kind of how it sits uh, alongside MHEP. Sure, yeah. Um, ju just in response to some of the comments that have already, already been made, I certainly echo um, in, in terms of the, the issues engaging commissioners, building the knowledge around how to commission IPS services. And we've seen that as a theme really uh, in IPS Grow that, that that's a, a definite complexity. 
uh, and the turnover, Ollie, <laughs> echo that too. Um, so yeah, the, I, I think the key differences are that um, but there's some, some key differences, but I think there's some merging going on as well. So, um, for example, when we first came into being, we were the infrastructure support for the huge expansion of IPS services um, and very much fidelity based. But it feels that over time we've had to introduce uh, much more sort of performance management ideas into what we're doing. Uh, and by that, um, the, the sort of uh, change that I'm re referring to is uh, we've included uh, an assessment of conversion rates uh, in our fidelity reviews. Uh, we've also uh, crucially included um, quality, diversity and inclusion um, uh, analysis as, as part of fidelity reviews. Um, so sort of some qualitative um, uh, uh, elements as well. Um, and I think we've had to move more into that space of, of, of uh, more involved performance management with we have quarterly calls and six weekly calls with all services. Um, that's uh, only just been fully rolled out in London, but in all other regions, that's been in place for, for quite some time. So, we're, and we have a data lead that's starting to draw insights, uh, you know, as MHEP would, would do. Um, I think the huge difference really is that we probably have a much broader view and a wider uh, involvement with services. So uh, we've developed the IPS Grow tool, we're looking at data, we're developing a lot of resources in the background and trying to connect communities on a much larger scale in IPS Grow. Uh, so we don't have that sort of not as an intensive one-on-one -on -one situation in terms of data management. Um, and one of my key thoughts around that, the intensive focus on, on data management um, is that often with IPS, it's very complex. Um, even the, the fidelity scale itself, it's such a jigsaw of interlocking pieces that you change one, you, you impact on another. And I think the same could be true of uh, a focus on any part of performance. It's often the case that something else gives and something else shifts. Um, so, uh, I guess, you know, for example, we've seen people that might be just focusing on access rather than the whole client journey. And and, and actually that's 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 no good. We, we, we need to have that that quality journey for somebody. Um, and I think uh, where MHEP have have shone a light really well is certainly on the sustainment side of things. Uh, post pandemic, um, it's been hard to get services to re um, invest in the sustainment being the ultimate goal, not the job outcome. I think people naturally say, yay, I've got a job. This is brilliant. Whereas uh, in the IPS world, we see sustainment as the ultimate goal. Um, so quite a number of differences in terms of, uh, yeah, the, 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 well, the area that we cover, you know, the platform that we've generated. I think we're trying to generate much more independence um, in the, uh, the, the, people that we were in the services that we work with um, and we're starting to push that much more proactively post training so to get cohorts of people to come together and share learning so I think we have um, a much broader space that we we fill uh, to support services rather that intensive look um, just on performance um, so yeah Okay, yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. And it, it's helpful to understand that it's quite challenging, actually, to compare MHEP and non-MHEP services. And Sarah, uh, Julia has already alluded to the kind of like different model within MHEP and this like really intense approach to uh, data and performance management. Do you want to say a few more words about kind of what that looks like in practice, how it works? And also, I guess it'd be interesting then to hear kind of how you're using this data to inform learning within MHEP, within the wider and the wider economy system yeah sure thanks Andrea I um thank you for sharing that Julia I think it gives an important um bit of background about if you're trying to compare yeah an MHEP social impact bond site with another site is that actually over the last few years that IPS Grow has been um operating their services have gotten better and better and they provide a really incredible service for all of the other services that sit outside of our MHIP cohort and that those comparisons between the two aren't MHIP versus an untethered service of their trying to deliver by themselves. They're actually receiving really useful, really great support from IPS Grow. So it really does, when you're comparing the inside SIB and outside SIB, you need to be taking into account what other amazing IPS Grow support those services are receiving. So I think the support that MHIP provides to um, the sites that are inside um, that are a part of the SIBs is slightly different from IPS Grow and I think um, there is a, a focus inside MHIP 
because of our very specific outcomes-based contracting on those specific outcomes. And I think um, the, the, the differences in terms of the areas of focus, um, as Julia says, that sometimes MHIP can provide a focus on sustainment that might not otherwise have been there. But there are, as um, when you read through the, the first stage report, um, that there are also some sort of limitations in the way that MHIP thinks about a very narrow outcomes-based focus and that we don't talk about a person's second job, we focus on their first job outcome. Um, and we don't focus on a person retaining work where they're already in a job, which um, the wider fidelity scale of IPS grow, they're quite, a, quite an important cohort. So there will be differences in focus across those two um, particular cohorts because an, a service outside of our substructure has a bit more freedom to focus on people retaining work or getting second or third or fourth jobs. Um, but in terms of the way that MHIP works with those services, I think we yeah, we have an ability to provide a much more in-depth personal performance management um, approach and kind of collaborative working as, as outlined in the report. I think during COVID is a really good example of um, how that collaborative um, work was able to, to shine and that our providers and our commissioners were in firefighting mode at the start of, of COVID. They were making sure that um, their service providers were safe, that their, you know, that their um, ESs were, you know, being supported if they were in work or not, trying to work out furlough. They were in the detail of trying to have a COVID response and having those tough financial conversations about what's going to happen to the payments it was really useful for MHIP to be able to take those take those points, do the financial modelling, have that negotiation with the commissioners and the providers whilst those two parties were sort of still firefighting um, the specific COVID response in their organisation. So I think the trust that MHIP had with the commissioners and with the providers to do that work and come up with changes to the contracts that were beneficial to all parties to be able to deliver these services in, in those difficult circumstances, I think was really speaks to some of that collaborative work that we're able to do because we had that more in-depth relationship with the providers. Thank you, Sarah. I can't believe we're almost at time. Uh, time's really flown by. And so sorry, I think there are still a couple of questions uh, in the chat that we didn't get a chance to come to. Um, maybe Julia or Sarah could pick up on the chat directly Sam's question around the, the role of social finance as a host organization, both for MHEP and IPS Girl. But perhaps for the final three minutes, we can look forward. And El, can I bring you into the discussion, perhaps for some uh, reflections around, you know, thinking about the, the future and kind of what are the key lessons take away that we can take from the MHEP experience and the MHEP evaluation work, given all this complexity, given the complexity of the commissioning landscape, given the challenges that we've heard um, from Julia and Sarah around comparing MHEP and non-MHEP sites, why are we to make of all this, both in terms of kind of understanding IPS and how to best support individuals with mental health or disability, learning disability issues, into sustained employment. And for those of us who've been asking about the kind of impact bonds, uh, kind of added value, do we, you know, are we hopeful will we ever be able to, to answer uh, this question? So three minutes, I guess, Al, for final remarks on the takeaway lessons moving forward. Thank you. So I think for those sort of hawkishly awaiting the evidence on SIBs, um, the next stages of this evaluation will be really um, ex important um, for, for that kind of conversation. But I actually think it's important that we sort of step back and take reflections from the work that's already been, been happening in this space to think about commissioning of IPS and employment services um, more generally. So I just wanted to offer uh, maybe two broad observations um, I think there's a really interesting um, intersection between the outcomes-based contracting and the evidence-backed intervention in IPS. So we already see that MHEP has offered a vehicle for propagating and scaling up IPS 
Um, and, and there's an important part of the evolution of the landscape that MHEP has been playing here. Um, and I think this speaks to some of the issues that have come up in other engaging with evidence sessions. Uh, we recently hosted a conversation about um, using high fidelity services in children's social care, where you know it's actually really hard to implement an evidence-backed intervention oftentimes in local areas. So there's something interesting about the wrapper of the outcomes focus that can be a part of that conversation. So I think that, that that's an important and lively kind of conversation. Um, and so if we're worried about the effectiveness or whether effectiveness of IPS is replicated outside of a trial setting, actually we've, we've already got the evidence for that on these MHEP projects. And we do see that despite the COVID disruptions, actually the achievement of employment outcomes, which is our closest proxy for the effect size that we see in the evidence, that holds up. So I think we should be really excited and really, um, you know, tuned in to the fact that these services are delivering really powerful employment outcomes at a project level. That should give us some confidence. Um, but actually, there's a much more subtle conversation going on between MHEP and broader NHS rollout. And I was really struck by what Julia was saying in terms of this dialogue between MHEP and IPS Grow and those reflections on quality as a multifaceted thing. So Julia, I think, you know, we really need to tune into those reflections around, yeah, what does quality look like here? It's not a focus on any single indicator and we really need to be tuned into that. And also Ollie's points around, you know, the distinction is not just MHEP, IPS versus all other IPS as far, uh, you know, there are other things happening in terms of the sustainability of contracts, team leadership, culture, and we need to be sensitive to that as well, that the SIB model might be an enabler for some of that, but it's certainly not the only thing that's varied across these, these two arms. So we need to be um, really cognizant of that as we go about developing the evidence conversation here. Thank you, Al, um, for an excellent uh, a synthesis of many of the themes um, that came up in the discussion. We're at time, so all that's left for me to do is to say a huge thank you to everyone who's made it all the way to the end of the session. It's been an incredibly rich discussion, and I hope it's just where your appetite to go ahead and read the, the full report. And a huge thanks both to uh, my colleagues, um, Ellen, Emily, and to our wonderful contributors, Sarah, uh, Julia, and Oli. Um, thank you all very much for joining us, and I, I'll hope to see you on the uh, next session of the Engaging with Evidence. But for now, it's goodbye from me. So, bye, everyone. Thank you.